course on the Great Depression. Uh, last week, we looked at the causes of the uh, depression uh, with a focus on the stock market crash and um, <clears throat> the events of the early 1930s. This lecture is going to address how ordinary people manage to live through the Great Depression of the 1930s. So before we get into the details, I would like to set the stage to give you um, a sense of what it was like to be in America in the 1930s, because it was so different than today. So just to give you a flavor of how things were, um, before you would retire at night, you would have to wind up your watches for the next day. Uh, men's pants buttoned the, had buttons on the fly since zippers did not appear until the late 1930s. Generally, men would wear garters to hold up their socks. To make a sandwich, you needed a knife because sliced bread had not yet been invented. When you wanted to write, you had to fill a fountain pen from inkwells as the ballpoint pen was yet to come. There were two mail deliveries every day. And when you traveled, red caps were available to help you with your luggage, but there was no wheels on suitcases in the 1930s. The 1930s was a time when doctors actually paid house visits. People smoked all the time. Uh, movie houses had balconies, and the five and ten cent Woolworth actually sold things for five and ten cents. And as far as drugs were concerned, for the 1930s, grass was something you mowed, coke was something you drank, and pot was something you cooked in. So there was no drug epidemic as we are more familiar with today. Uh, in your car, you shifted gears and you lowered the windows by hand. Gas station attendants would rush to fill the tank, check the oil, wipe the windows, and provide free roadmaps. And in the 1930s, 45 million Americans had no indoor plumbing, and most of those 45 million also had no access to electricity. So, this gives a sense of how different the 1930s was from today. But the most indelible aspect of the decade of the 1930s was, of course, the Great Depression. So when we look at the effects of the Great Depression, last week I mentioned that Blue Skies was the anthem of the 1920s because of the optimism and the prosperity of the 1920s. Well, if there was an anthem of the 1930s, that anthem would be, brother, can you spare a dime? Now, I'm having some difficulty advancing the PowerPoint, so I'm going to have to do something here. Um, okay. Oops. Yes. Um, so you're probably familiar with the lyrics of this song. Um, they, used, they used to tell me I was building a dream, um, but I, I built it with brick and mortar and lime. But now in the 1930s, brother, can you spare a dime? By 1932, some 13 million Americans were unemployed. That is one out of every four able and willing workers. Now, um, that's about the number of unemployed we have today, except that the population today is much larger. So unemployment today is about 8%. But 13 million Americans out of work in 1933 represented 25% of the workforce. So that meant that every fourth household had no breadwinner, no income, and very little hope 
those who remained on the payroll had to work shorter hours. Uh, perhaps one third of all employed people were working part time. So in the aggregate, almost 50% of the nation's workforce was going underutilized in the 1930s. Now, there had been unemployment before in American history, but nothing like the Great Depression, nothing of this magnitude or of this duration. And we also have to appreciate that in the early 1930s, there was no stabilizer, there was no safety net to the American economy. There was no social security, no unemployment insurance, no guarantee for your bank deposits. Those are some of the reasons why, if we do go through another depression, it certainly will not be as bad as the Great Depression of the 1930s, because we do have a social safety net today. <clears throat> but in the 1930s, there was a sense of desperation. And some people even spoke about the desirability of the dictatorship in the United States. You know, Winston Churchill said that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. And what he meant by that is that in democracy, things move slowly. There are debates, there are votes, um, and it takes a while before things get done. Whereas under a dictatorship, the dictator decides and things happen. And so, for example, in Europe during the 1930s, which was also hit very hard by the Great Depression, uh, every country in Central and Eastern Europe opted for a dictatorial type of government during the Depression, with one exception, and that was Czechoslovakia. So some people in the United States said maybe we should have a dictatorship here. Now, while relatively few people literally starved in the United States, genuine hunger was widespread. Desperate people took desperate measures in order to feed themselves. In rural areas, hungry people sometimes turned to eating weeds. In cities, men could be seen digging through garbage cans and city dumps. Some families lived in caves while others inhabited sewer pipes because they had nowhere else to live. There was no mechanism in place to combat mass destitution on this scale. Poverty and joblessness in American history was certainly nothing new, but now it was affecting the middle class the new poor was now joining the traditional poor on bread lines and at soup kitchens. One third of the Harvard class of 1911 confessed that they were on relief or that they were dependent on relatives. Incomes of doctors and lawyers fell 40% during the 1930s. Among the unskilled laborers building a reservoir in California could be found ministers, engineers, a school principal, and even the former president of a Missouri bank. They were all now working as unskilled laborers. Many Americans believed they were witnessing not just a massive market downturn, but the collapse of a historic economic, political, and social order. Some even thought that it was the end of the American way of life. But curiously, most Americans remained inexplicit, inexplicably docile, even passive, in the face of this unprecedented calamity. The initial reaction of most people was bewilderment, defeat, and even self-blame. The New Yorker magazine summed up the contemporary mood in 1931 when it said, quote, people are in a sad but not rebellious mood, 
The fact is, most people believe that their poverty was not the fault of anyone but themselves. It was a personal shortcoming that left them in such a state. This was the result of the values that permeated America at that time. The value of self-reliance and individualism, which was part of the fabric of the American value system. And so, because people believed in self-reliance and individualism, they felt that their plight in the 1930s was their fault. But not everyone was so resigned or so docile. There was some looting of food stores. In December of 1931, there was a small communist-led hunger march on Washington. A few weeks later, priest in Pittsburgh led an army of 12,000 jobless men to agitate for unemployment legislation. In March of 1931, a riot at the Ford River Rouge plant in Michigan left four dead and 50 wounded. But most of the small acts of lawlessness were not recorded because newspaper editors were afraid that publicity would only encourage further acts of violence. An interesting barometer of a nation's health can be discerned by looking at immigration. How many people want to come into the country? How many people want to leave? Throughout the 1930s, emigration from the United States exceeded immigration to the United States. That is, more people left than were coming in. And one of the places that Americans wanted to go to during the 1930s was the Soviet Union. Because in Stalin's Russia, there was no unemployment. In fact, it was illegal to be unemployed in Stalinist Russia. And so to many Americans, the depression seemed to prove that capitalism did not work. And some people looked to communism in the Soviet Union as the wave of the future. However, the American Communist Party, although it grew during the 1930s, it was never to the degree that it became a significant political force. Amtorg, a Russian trading company, was receiving 350 applications a day from Americans who wanted to settle in Russia. So now let's look at how specific groups of Americans were impacted by this unprecedented economic catastrophe. The first group we will look at are farmers. By 1930, about 25% of the American population was engaged in agriculture. And of all groups in America, farmers suffered the most from the depression. And that was because of overproduction. Because farmers were producing so much, supply was much greater than demand. And when that happens, crop prices fall. And farmers found they could not pay their debts. They could not pay the mortgages on their farms. And so by 1932, nearly a third of all farmers faced foreclosures for back taxes or debt. Nationwide, one in 20 was losing their farms. And then by the early 1930s, an environmental disaster occurred. Rain disappeared for years on end. And with no sod to hold the earth in place, the soil calcified and the wind started to blow. Dust clouds boiled up up to 10,000 feet or more in the sky, and it rolled like a moving mountain. And when the dust fell, it penetrated everything. Your hair, your nose, your throat, dust settled in the kitchen, in the bedroom, in the water wells. A scoop shovel was needed just to clean your house in the morning. And the strangest thing was the darkness. People tied themselves to ropes before going to a barn 
just a few hundred feet away in order to find their way. Chickens roosted in the middle of the afternoon as the skies darkened. And people, people began to joke about, about it because there was nothing else they could do. Uh, one person said, I've got Texas in my heart, but Oklahoma in my lungs. But deep down, people were very afraid. Weather forecasting at that time was very primitive compared with today. So most of these dust storms came without warning. The worst dust of all was on April 14, 1935. It was called Black Sunday. As far as the eye could see, clouds boiled and boomed with birds thronging ahead of them desperate to escape. That storm carried twice as much dirt as was dug out of the earth in order to build the Panama Canal. More than 300,000 tons of Great Plains topsoil went into the air that day. The sky turned pur purple and temperatures plunged. At its peak, the Dust Bowl covered more than 100 million acres. More than a quarter million people fled the Dust Bowl in the 1930s, and many tenant farmers uh, referred to as exodusters began to head west in their jalopies. These battered wrecks of cars loaded with all the family's belongings. But two thirds of people living in the center of the Dust Bowl never left because either they lacked the money to go or because they believed in a better tomorrow. American meteorologists rate the Dust Bowl as the greatest weather disaster of the 20th century. Historians say it was the nation's worst prolonged environmental catastrophe. So now we're going to move away from farmers and to see how did families cope with the Great Depression. And some of you may have remembered family members who actually lived through the Great Depression. And so some of the things that I'm going to talk about might sound very familiar. The average American family lived by the motto, use it up, wear it out, make do or do without. Many tried to keep up appearances and tried to carry on with life as close to normal as possible while they were trying to adapt to new economic circumstances. Let us look at the impact on homes and marriages. Americans shared living quarters with many family members. Family members who could no longer afford housing would move in with other family members. Marriages tended, tended to be postponed during the 1930s. Couples delayed having children, and the birth rate fell below the replacement level. Um, the replacement level is 2.1 children. And during the 1930s, the birth rate was significantly below that. Women sought birth control as an economic measure. Abortion also became more common, even though they were illegal. Couples tended to remain in unhappy marriages out of desperation because divorce was expensive. By 1940, one and a half million married women were living apart from their husbands. Shoppers were concerned with saving money and that resulted in bulk shopping. And by the way, this was before Costco. Um, but you tended to buy um, more than what you needed in order to store cans on your shelves. Um, if it was a, a sale, you bought it, whether you needed it or not. Women's magazines and radio programs taught Depression-era homemakers how to stretch their food budget with casseroles and with one-pot meals. Favorites included chili, macaroni and cheese, soups, and chipped beef on toast. In 
potlucks, often organized by churches, became a popular way to share food and a cheap form of social entertainment. Families also planted gardens. They canned foods, they sewed their own clothing, and they did household repairs themselves. We didn't go hungry, but we did live lean. That expression sums up the experiences of many American families in the 1930s. In 1935, the median annual family income was $1,160. That's an annual income. And that translated into about $20 a week in order to cover all expenses, including food, shelter, clothing, and perhaps an occasional treat, like going to the movies. Families became conscious of their poverty, and so they didn't invite people over. They invited family members because families wouldn't complain if they were sitting on a couch that was in disrepair. So as a result, much more family activity took place during the Depression than ever before. And you may remember in the movie, The Wizard of Oz, where Dorothy says at the end, you can search your heart's desire, but there is no place like home. Now that was written into the movie. It was not part of the story by L. Frank Baum. And The Wizard of Oz came out in 1939, when America was still steeped in the Depression. <clears throat> Strong families became more tightly uh, knit, whereas weak families tended to disintegrate. Desertion rates skyrocketed during the 1930s. The average American family didn't have much extra income to spend on leisure activities. Before the 1930s, going to the movie theater was a major pastime but few Americans could afford that luxury after the stock market crashed. So more than one third of all cinemas in the United States closed between 1929 and 1934. Often people just chose to spend time at home. Neighbors got together to play cards and board games such as Scrabble and Monopoly, both introduced in the 1930s, became very popular. Middle-class kids remained in school because there were no jobs, but lower-class kids took to the rails so they wouldn't be a burden to the family. In all social classes, marriage tended to be delayed. Men experienced the Depression different from the way females experienced it. Men tended to define their primary role as that of wage earner, and they felt shamed over losing jobs and not being able to support their families. I ain't a man no more, wailed one ex-auto worker. Um, Studs Terkel wrote a book called Working, in which he interviewed uh, men during the Depression. And that is what one man said, I ain't a man no more because he could no longer provide for his family. And so self-esteem plummeted. Um, men tended to put suits on while they had breakfast with their wives and then told their wives they were going out to find a job, but they knew that was hopeless. And so they spent the rest of the day in their suits on a park bench and then went home at night and lied about seeking a job. Women at times, um, well, I'm sorry, one father um, expressed his feelings of emasculation when he said, I haven't had a steady job in more than two years. What's wrong with me that I can't protect my children? And women expressed exasperation sometimes, said one woman, they're not men anymore, if you know what I mean. And impotence became more common in the 1930s. <clears throat>
and suicide and desertion also became more common. Many of the poor took to the rails, riding illegally on the rods beneath the freight cars or on the roof of the freight cars. An average 700 train hoppers a day passed through Kansas City. The Southern Pacific Railroad reported that in a 12 month period, its guards had thrown off 683,000 people or freight trains. African American men particularly had it rough because there was a greater risk of black hobos getting arrested or even lynched. Now let's look at how the depression affected women. Women saw their roles in the household enhanced as they juggled in order to make ends meet. Women helped to alleviate the effects of the depression through budgeting the family income, making goods and services they previously had purchased. Women's roles expanded inside the family. They would take in laundry or take in borders. They would cut hair and sew dresses. Sociologists Robert and Helen Lind wrote Middletown, a study in modern American culture. And they noticed this trend in a study of Muncie, Indiana. And this was published in 1937. The men cut adrift from their usual routine, lost much of their sense of time and dawdled helplessly and dully about the streets. While in the homes, the women's world remained largely intact. And the round of cooking, house cleaning and mending became, if anything, more absorbent. So to put it another way, no housewife lost her job during the Great Depression. Women may do by buying day old bread or by warming several dishes in the oven to save gas. And living so close to the edge, women prayed that no catastrophic accident or illness would swamp their tight budgets. We had no choice, remembered one housewife. We just did what had to be done one day at a time. Women who were widowed or divorced or whose husband had deserted them struggled to keep their families afloat. Single women had to fend for themselves. These women were truly living on the margins. The iconic image of the depression is the forgotten man the newly poor, downwardly mobile, unemployed worker, often standing in a bread line or selling apples on a street corner. But women who found themselves in similar dire straits rarely turned up in public spaces like bread lines or street corners. Instead, they often try to cope quietly on their own. By 1940, one and a half million married women, as I mentioned before, were living apart from their husbands. More than 200,000 vagrant children wandered the countryside as a result of the breakup of their families. And women's roles expanded outside the family as well. Some 2 million additional women entered the labor force in the 1930s, often over the objection of their husbands. But then, even then, women's wages lagged far behind the wages of men. Women who sought relief or paid employment risked public scorn for supposedly taking jobs and money away from more deserving men. Some states even passed laws prohibiting married women from working. So, Forced to take on even more important roles in their homes and families, women played an often unrecognized role in helping the country live through the Great Depression. So hard times work to reinforce traditional gender roles rather than subverting them. Now let us look at how the Great Depression impacted children. In families, that were in turmoil, children often suffered the most. Many ran away. Uh, some became hobos. Some lived as nomads. Some 
rode the rails. They were referred to as boxcar children. The special times that usually brought joy to children were often the hardest to bear during the Depression. Christmas and birthdays were particularly painful. Many children in the 1930s had no childhood whatsoever. Many of them had to abandon school and malnutrition was common. New York City school officials reported that some 20,000 malnourished children were going to school in, the in 1932. When a teacher told a young girl to go home and eat, she replied, I can't. This is my sister's day to eat. Often children, especially boys, were called upon to supplement meager family incomes by working after school or by not going to school and trying to find jobs. When mothers found it necessary to get a job, older children, especially girls, were given the responsibility of looking after their younger brothers or sisters. The despair and desperation of children can be seen by letters that children wrote to President Roosevelt and his wife, Eleanor. And here's one sample. Uh, this is a letter written on November 6, 1936. And it reads, Dear Mrs. Roosevelt, I am writing to you for some of your old soil dresses, if you have any, as I am a poor girl who has to stay out of school on account of dresses and slips and a coat. I am in seventh grade, but I have to stay out of school because I have no books or clothes to wear. If you have any soil clothes that you don't want to wear, I would be very glad to get them. But please do not let the newspaper reporters get hold of this in any way, and I will keep it from getting out here so there will be no one else to get hold of it. But do not let my name get out of the get out in the papers. I am 13 years old. Yours truly, Miss L. H. And there were hundreds, if not thousands, of similar letters. And interestingly, most of them were sent to Eleanor Roosevelt rather than to her husband, the president, because there was a general sense that Eleanor Roosevelt was more responsive to their plight. By 1940, more than 200,000 vagrant children were wandering the country as a result of the breakup of their families. Now let us see the impact of the Great Depression on African Americans. The Depression was a disaster for most Americans but Blacks suffered a disproportionate share of the burden. <clears throat> the Negro was born in depression. It only became official when it hit the white man, said Clifford Burke, who was quoted in Studs Terkel's Hard Times, an oral history of the Great Depression. When layoffs began in 1929, Blacks were often the first to get the pink slip. By 1932, black unemployment reached 50%. Now, <clears throat> while the black unemployment rate was one and a half times that of whites, only 25% of blacks received any public relief. And when they did, it was usually less than that received by whites. In the South, unemployed whites displace blacks from jobs that they previously regarded as beneath them, such as garbage collectors, elevator operators, waiters, and bellhops. And for those blacks lucky enough to have jobs, their wages were at least 30% below those of white workers, who themselves were barely at subsistence level. A depression era study showed a correlation between economic distress and violence committed against blacks. The numbers of lynchings in the United States rose from eight in 1932 
to 28 in 1933, then 15 in 1934, and 20 in 1935. In 1930, nine out of 10 African-American women worked in agric agriculture or domestic service. And both areas, agriculture and domestic service, were hit hard by the Depression. White household, housewives who previously hired servants, they began to do their own housework. Sometimes white women would compete with black women for jobs previously considered too undesirable by white women. As a result, 50% of black women lost their jobs in the 1930s. Although more black women, 38%, than white women, 24%, were in the workforce. Even FDR's New Deal, which we will look at next week, even the New Deal contained racist elements. As the leader of a political party that was heavily represented in Congress by racist Southern Democrats, President Roosevelt had to choose his battles carefully. At times, he appeared timid in the face of racial injustice, especially when viewed from the perspective of today. And so New Deal public work projects rarely employed blacks. And these public work projects maintain racist wage differentials. The work of the Federal Housing Administration served to build the walls of segregation. Blacks were excluded from participation in programs such as Social Security, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Tennessee Valley Authority, among others. And in 1937, Southern Democrats filibusted to defeat a federal anti-lynching bill. Oh, now let's look at how other minorities were impacted by the depression. The first group that we're going to look at, one second here. First group that we're going to look at will be Mexicans. One second here. Mexican Americans did not benefit from New Deal programs such as Social Security or the Fair Labor Standards Act because those programs did not apply to farm laborers. And that was the occupation of most Mexican Americans in the 1930s. The FBI shipped 400,000 naturalized Mexican-Americans back to Mexico during the 1930s. Some left voluntarily, but many who were rounded up were packed into sealed boxcars and shipped across the border. So these were naturalized American citizens. Nevertheless, they were rounded up and sent back to Mexico um, as a way to relieve uh, unemployment. Uh, it's estimated that one third of the Mexican American population in the 1930s returned to Mexico. Asian Americans were impacted as well. Um, in California, uh, Chinese and Japanese uh, Americans found education and employment opportunities barred to them. And Jews suffered in particular during the 1930s as anti-Semitism increased dramatically. Um, some people referred to the new Roosevelt's New Deal as the Jew Deal. That is that it was a conspiracy uh, against wealthy Gentile Americans. More and more professions were closed to Jews and quotas were imposed at most elite colleges and universities. The most popular radio program in the 1930s was that of Father Charles Coughlin, a Catholic priest. He was known as the radio priest and he charged that Jews were agents of international communism. Some 15 million people 
listen to his Sunday night anti-Semitic tirades. He also claimed that Jews were intent on dragging America into another world war. Opinion polls before and during World War II reflected widespread fear and animosity towards Jews in the United States during the 1930s. But it would be a mistake to conclude that everyone was destitute during the Great Depression. In fact, some businesses actually flourished. So for example, the contraceptive industry netted a quarter billion dollars a year in the 1930s. I mentioned earlier that the movie industry suffered at the start of the depression, but then it got creative. It cut ticket prices in half. It offered double features for the price of one ticket, and it introduced giveaways to fill empty seats, giveaways such as dish night or silverware night. And all of this revived movie houses across the nation so that by the middle of the 1930s, more than half the population would go to the movies at least once a week. And another business that, profit, that profited during the 1930s was the cigarette industry, as the numbers of cigarette smokers increased each year during the 1930s. While for the vast majority of Americans, the 1930s was a time of misery, yet swanky nightclubs like the New York Store Club and El Morocco flourished. Newspapers continued to feature advertisements for luxury items such as diamonds and furs. But on the whole, most Americans suffered as never before during the Great Depression. So I think this gives us some renewed appreciation for our parents or grandparents who managed to survive this economic calamity. Um, <clears throat> Now, what I would like to do is to turn to the a topic of crime and gangsters during the 1930s. An alarming number of Americans looked for easy money through kidnapping, robbery, and even murder. Across the Midwest, bands of marauding tra travelers in fast moving cars with sawed off shotguns and tommy guns were knocking over rural banks and post offices. In cities, organized crime raked in millions of dollars through extortion and prostitution and gambling. But the fact is, there was much more crime depicted in the films of the 1930s than actually occurred in real life. Bonnie and Clyde, went on a two-year bank robbing spree across America. And Charles Lindbergh's toddler son was abducted and murdered. These high profile events contributed to a sense of lawlessness during the Great Depression. It stoked fears that hard times had created a crime wave in America. But this was really more hype than reality. Crime was largely mythologized during the Great Depression. Yes, violent crimes did initially spike during the first few years of the 1930s. So let's look at this chart of homicide rates per 100,000 population. So you can see homicide rates increased steadily up until 1932. But from 1932 to the early 1940s, homicide rates actually declined steeply. And this was, of course, during the Great Depression. Nevertheless, many people who were impoverished and embittered by the Depression found a certain satisfaction when bank robberies did occur. And the reason for this is that the reputation of bankers was at an all-time low during the, the Depression. Banks were foreclosing on mortgages. Banks were taking land away from farmers 
and thieves such as John Dillinger and Pretty Boy Floyd were widely regarded as Robin Hood folk heroes, robbing from the rich and giving to the poor. And that tendency to romanticize criminals was illustrated in a ballad by Woody Guthrie called Pretty Boy Floyd. And the lyrics say, as through this world I ramble, I see lots of funny men. Some will rob you with a six gun and some with a fountain pen. But as through this life you'll travel, wherever you may roam, you won't never see an outlaw drive a family from their home. So this illustrates this antipathy towards bankers and romanticizing uh, bank robbers. But despite popular fascination and admiration with the likes of John Dillinger and Bonnie and Clyde and Babyface Nelson and Machine Gun Kelly and Ma Barker, the fact is they were more often cold-blooded killers than latter-day Robin Hoods. Now let us take a look at art and literature during the 1930s. Much of the art and literature of the decade reflected a leftist cultural mood, often casting workers and farmers as heroes and capitalists as villains. John Steinbeck's 1939 novel, The Grapes of Wrath, glorified a simple rural way of life while condemning the greed and intolerance of the agricultural growers of California. Jack Conroy's The Disinherited was a 1933 chronicle of an average industrial worker's life during the Great Depression, and it conveyed disillusionment and cynicism with the capitalist system. Many intellectuals and writers, such as Langston Hughes, John Dos Passos, and Ernest Hemingway, were also disillusioned with capitalism, and they formed allegiances with the Communist Party. The Federal Art Project was a government program designed to provide work for artists affected by the Great Depression. And many of these artists painted murals on public buildings or courthouses or public post offices. Some of these murals can even be seen today. Social realism became an important art movement during the Great Depression. It generally portrayed imagery with socio-political meaning, reflecting the realities of life during the Great Depression. As you can see from this mural. Uh, one of these artists who was part of the social realist movement was Edward Hopper. And his iconic painting, The Nighthawks, expressed the loneliness and alienation that many people experienced in the 1930s. Thomas Hart Benton is perhaps the best known muralist associated with American painting in the 1930s and his murals depicted the plight of the working class during the Depression. The art of photography also played an important role in this social realist movement during the Great Depression. The work of photographers such as Dorothea Lange and Walker Evans not only provides enduring evidence of hard times, but also established the photographic documentary as an art form. Now, when we look at popular culture in the 1930s, the dominant theme of popular culture was escapism, to escape the deprivation and hardship of the 1930s, particularly by going to the movies and listening to radio programs. And also, cartoons became a form of escapism. This was when Walt Disney made Mickey Mouse uh, very popular during the 1930s. And comic books, such as Batman. Batman begins as an orphan, and he becomes wealthy, living in Wayne Manor. And he fights crime. And Superman is another 
superhero who begins as an orphan. Um, as I mentioned before, games such as Monopoly became diversions and movie serials on Saturday afternoon, such as Flash Gordon or Tarzan or Buck Rogers or Tom Mix became very popular. You would go to the movies, you would see a serial, and then you would see a double feature. And the next week, you would see the next episode in the serial, and so on. <clears throat> and as often as not, the radio was the most prominent piece of furniture in the living room in the 1930s. The big box was everyone's ticket to adventure, laughter, music, and romance. Network programs were scheduled with families in mind. Serials for housewives were programmed during the day. Children programs came in the late afternoon or early evening, programs such as The Lone Ranger. And news and comedies and variety programs would be aired at night. After breakfast, serial dramas kept housewives intrigued all days. One show began, can this girl from a mining town in the West find happiness as the wife of a wealthy and titled Englishman? Now, that might resonate with some of you. That was from a soap opera called Our Gal Sunday. Every weekday evening from 7 to 7.15 p.m., telephone use across the country dropped 50%. Why? Because 30 million Americans tuned in to Amos and Andy, the most popular comedy serial at that time. So here is a flavor of radio programs on Sunday night at 7 p.m., Jack Benny. Monday night, Amos and Andy. Tuesday, Fibber McGee and Molly. Thursday at 8.30, The Green Hornet. And then Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. And Gangbusters became a very popular radio series. And also The Shadow Nose. Radio also brought the immediacy of news directly into the home. The Lindbergh case, the Hindenburg disaster, news of the pending crisis in Europe, and a program that broadcast an invasion from Mars. That was, of course, uh, Orson Welles' War of the World, which caused a panic across the United States. Unlike the automobile, Radio was affordable to almost everyone, and some people even built their own radios out of parts available at the dime store. Only basic mechanical skills were necessary to build a simple crystal radio set. And listening to the radio was a communal experience, as four or five people would gather with friends and family around the radio. By 1938, listening to the radio was the nation's favorite pastime. Radio displaced newspapers as the main source of information. The largest audience, radio audience ever, tuned in to the Max Schmeling, Joe Lewis fight of June 1938. 63.7% of all potential listeners tuned in to that event. Now let's take a look at the films of the Great Depression. In 1929, the introduction of sound resulted in about 100 million people going to the movies every week. But as I mentioned, at the beginning of the Depression, profits began to fall. But then movie theaters cut admission prices to bolster attendance. By the time FDR took office in March of 1933, movie receipts were only 40% of what they were just two years earlier. 
So cutting ticket prices was not sufficient. So other gimmicks were used. Bank night involved drawing lucky numbers with cash rewards for the chosen few. Crackery would be distributed in lobbies on given nights. And by 1936, major movie studios were beginning to show a profit. Hollywood tried to keep alive the myth of a mobile and classless society where anyone could become successful. Critics on the political left charged that movies represented the bread and circuses of bourgeois ruling cliques, that movies were just hypnotizing the masses and keeping them from revolting. In 1934, a production code removed from films scenes depicting sex, revenge killing, and the dynamiting of banks and other American institutions. Um, although radio, books, music, sports, and other forms of mass entertainment were significant in the 1930s, nothing was as central to popular culture during the decade of the Great Depression than motion pictures. And so movies became the preeminent form of popular culture during the Depression. An average of 60 to 75 million movie tickets were purchased each week, which meant that 60% of the American population went to see a movie every week. Hollywood made more than 5,000 feature films during the 1930s. And one of the most popular themes of those films were gangster films. The prototype of the early 30s gangster genre was the movie Little Caesar. But Rico, played by Edward G. Robinson, is really a sympathetic character. He wants to make money and be somebody. Uh, he wants to destroy anyone that gets in the way of his ambition. And so the character of Rico became the epitome of the self-centered, acquisitive man, uh, a symbol of a greedy businessman. And the last line in the movie when he is shot was, could this be the end of Rico? And after the success of that film, some 50 gangster movies were made in 1931 alone. Parent groups and editorials denounced the poisonous effect of these movies on the young. James Cagney, who played the role of Tommy Powers in the film Public Enemy, was a more sympathetic gangster. He wasn't self-centered like Rico, and it, he was seen as the victim of an unjust society. Other films in the 1930s were escapist in nature. Marx brother comedies mocked politics, along with everything else. Screwball comedies like Frank Capra's It Happened One Night stressed a breezy nuttiness that worked to pull things together, marriages, social classes, rather than break them apart. And of course, the greatest escapist movies of all were Busby's Berkeley's musicals, which lifted the spirits and held out hope for better times. The Wizard of Oz can also be seen in this light of escapism, along with the popularity of Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers, and Superman. Toward the end of the 1930s, Frank Capra made Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, and another film, Meet John Doe, and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. These films depicted the rich and powerful as forces of evil in opposition to the will of the American people. And in these films, it ended with common and decent people prevailing over evil, wealthy people. Movies made a central contribution towards reassuring Americans that wrongs could be set right, and that the future was not so frightening. The music of the 1930s featured big bands. Big bands consisted of 15 to 20 players who were heard throughout the country at dances, on the radios, in movies. A style of couples dance called swing dancing went along with big band jazz musicians. One such dance was called the jitterbug. It featured partners throwing each other over their heads and through the legs. 
Legendary band leaders of the 1930s included Count Basie, Tommy Dorsey, Duke Ellington, Benny Goodman, Woody Herman, Harry James, Glenn Miller, and Artie Shore. Most bands also featured singers, mostly female, and many vocal recording artists of this period got their start with big bands. The combo jazz band also became popular in the 1930s. Benny Goodman led a very influential combo band that was racially mixed, which was unusual in a segregated America at that time, when most bands were either all African-American or all white American. Goodman brought a new respectability to jazz. He made it extremely popular in the 1930s to the point where it became part of mainstream American culture. Billie Holiday had a seminal influence on jazz and pop singing. Her vocal style, strongly inspired by jazz instrumentalists, pioneered a new way of manipulating phrases and tempo. Woody Guthrie, a singer and guitar player from Oklahoma, became America's best known balladeer in the 1930s. He was called a Shakespeare in overalls, and he traveled all over the country writing folk songs about being down and out in the depression with songs entitled So Long It's Been Good to Know You, Going Down the Road, and Hard Traveling. He wrote This Land is Your Land as a retort to Irving Berlin's God Bless America. Now, you're all familiar with the lyrics of This Land is Your Land, but there was a stanza in that song that was later banned. Mm -hmm. And the stanza that was banned goes like this. As I went walking, I saw a sign there. And on the sign, it said no trespassing. But on the other side, it didn't say nothing. That side was made for you and me. In the shadow of the steeple, I saw my people. By the relief office, I seen my people. As they stood there hungry, I stood there asking, is this land made for you and me? So this was more of a revolutionary stanza, um, questioning uh, private, private ownership of property uh, and questioning whether capitalism in America really serves the interests of the American people. And uh, during the Red Scare of the McCarthy era, this stanza was banned. So the radio, movies, and the music of the 1930s was extremely important in bringing together the creative talents of Blacks, Jews, Irishmen, Italians, writers, painters, composers, and photographers worked to incite, to amuse, to inform, or to console a beleaguered nation. And so the popular culture of the 1930s helped people cope with their lives and helped them to make sense of their lives. So that is my take on how people lived through the Great Depression. And at this time, we will take a look at the questions or comments that you 